I uh, <clears throat> have to tell you this. I have to uh, have a confession to make. I am experimenting this morning, and all of you are the guinea pigs. <laughs> See, normally, when I have a sermon, I type it all out word for word, and then that way if I get up here and I, my brain seizes, I can at least find where I am after a minute and, and keep going. But this morning, I'm not going to do that. I'm preaching from notes. I've been told by people who preach professionally that that's the way you're supposed to do it. So I decided, okay, I'll give it a try. Now, the way I see it, there's only one of three outcomes that this is going to turn out. Number one, everything goes great, and I'll be happy. Number two, this sermon will last about three minutes, and all of you will be happy. <laughs> and number three, we'll all leave here this afternoon thinking, none of that made a lick of sense. <laughs> so, if you would, bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful, dear Lord, that we can gather together as your people to worship you on this Sabbath day, and we ask for the blessing of the Holy Spirit to be here with us as we worship you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when I was uh, much younger and had just been elected to be an, an elder, I was terrified when I was having my first sermon. So I, I happened to be talking to my dad at the time, and so I asked him for some advice because he was an elder been an elder for a long time. He said, uh, I was worried about what kind of sermon illustrations to use, and he said, that's easy, don't worry about it. Talk about stuff that you know about or that you're interested in, and then work those into your sermon as an illustration for what you're, what you're going to be talking about. I said, okay, that, that makes sense. So this morning, I'm going to be talking about something that I've been interested in for a long time. Now, I'm about to date myself. I started first grade a month after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So, this morning, Whoop. Whoop. We will be talking about something that I'm interested in, <clears throat> and that's space. When I was a little kid watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon, I thought space was the place. I had it all figured out. I was going to grow up and I was going to walk on the moon just like Neil Armstrong. I was going to ride the big rocket. And then I was going to cruise the galaxy in a starship just like Captain Kirk. You know, growing up, I never could understand why video from the moon did, never looked as good as video on Star Trek. But anyway, it's space and rockets and stuff is something that I've always been interested in. So the other day I was just curious, so I started looking up facts and figures on things in space. And... I got to looking at things like, what is the biggest star? What is the hottest star? Stuff like that. So I consulted the great mind of, of the age, Wikipedia. <laughs> and I asked, what is the brightest star that scientists know about? And there's a picture of it. It's the fuzzy blob right in the middle. I'm sorry, this is the best picture we have. You have to keep in mind it is 100,000 light years from here. <clears throat> but the star right in the middle is the brightest star that scientists know of today. And it has a really catchy name. It's called R136A1. Now, I can guarantee no mother in this place today would name their child R136A1. But that's the name of this star. It is the brightest star. It's also the most massive star. And the interesting thing they are about stars is the bigger and heavier they are, the brighter they are.
But there's a limit to how big and how bright a star can get. And scientists have very carefully done the calculations and they have figured out exactly how big a star can be. It can't be any bigger than that. And that works out to about 150 times more massive than our own sun. And that's the limit. Stars can't exist that are larger than that. But there's a problem. R136A1 is not 150 times more massive than our sun. It's 250 times more massive than our sun, which is very embarrassing. My poor star, nobody has told it that it can't exist. So how bright is it if it's the brightest star? Well, if it's 250 times the size of our sun, you'd think it was 250 times brighter. <clears throat> but it doesn't work that way. It's not 250 times, and it's not 1,000 times brighter than our sun. It is 7.4 million times brighter than our sun. So that's the brightest star that they know about. So I decided, what is the hottest star? And this is the answer that I got. This is the Red Spider Nebula. Now, a nebula is a cloud of gas and dust floating out in space. And the reason it's glowing is because there's always a star somewhere in it that heats it up so it, you can see it. But if you look at this picture real closely, on the outside edges, it's kind of red, and then it gets a little brighter towards the middle, and it gets white in the middle, and then there's a black spot in the middle. That's because, well, I have to explain something about how, how heat works. Those of you who cook with electricity, if you turn on the burner just a little bit, the, the little burner elements are black, and then they might turn just a little bit brown. Have you seen that? If you turn it up just a little bit more, they turn kind of a dull red, and you turn it up a little more, it turns red, and you turn it up a little more, it turns bright red. If you turn it up all the way, it might even turn orange, and that's really hot. But what if it's hotter than that? Well, a light bulb like this, the filament is several thousand degrees, and we call that white hot. It's really hot. But what if it's hotter than that? Well, if you cook with gas, you know that the blue part of the flame is the hot part. It's really hot. So blue is hotter than white. But what if it's hotter than that? Well, if it gets hotter than blue, it turns in ultraviolet. Ultraviolet, we can't see. But what if it's hotter than ultraviolet? Well, then it becomes x-rays. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why you can't see the star in the middle of this picture. The star here is so hot, the only light it produces is x-rays. The other way to think of it is it's so hot, it doesn't give off any heat. And that's, the why, that's why you can't see it. It's so hot, it's invisible. Amazing. You know, astronomers have discovered, oh, just random factoid. Our sun is about 10,000 degrees. This star is 560,000 degrees. Over the years, astronomers have been building bigger and bigger telescopes and better and better instruments, and they have found planets around other stars. And they found enough so far that they think that there could be as many as four billion planets in our galaxy that might could support life as we know it. Of course, that's not counting the planets that support life not as we know it. So that's just in our galaxy. So they decided that they were going to use the Hubble Space Telescope, which, of course, is a wonderful instrument, and they were going to look at an empty patch of sky. And you can just barely see it up there. I, I drew a square around it. It's just a small piece of the sky. 
They were going to take a long exposure photograph. Now, if you know anything about pho uh, photography, if you've ever set the shutter speed on your camera for two or three seconds, that's a long exposure. But they didn't use just two or three seconds. They pointed it at an empty part of the sky, and they left the shutter open for 23 days. And in the middle of this empty part of the sky, <clears throat> excuse me, I only have sinus trouble when I have the sermon. <clears throat> in this empty part of the sky that nobody had ever detected anything before, they found a gazillion galaxies. Now, if every galaxy had four billion planets that support life, and who knows how many galaxies, just think how many people there are in the universe. Boggles the mind. And finally, I have one picture here that's a picture taken by the Voyager space probe on the edge of our solar system. And it's a picture of Earth. Everybody see it? It's right there. <laughs> Having trouble? Okay. There it is. There we are. Everybody wave. Okay. I can blow it up a little bit for you. You are there. And there we are. That's the best picture we have of our planet on the outside looking in. You know, it's amazing if you go back to those other pictures, you couldn't even see Earth. We are nothing in this universe. We are so tiny and so insignificant that if we were to disappear right now, nobody would even notice. It wouldn't make a blip in the whole universe. We are nothing. We don't have the brightest star. You know, I like our sun and it's nice and warm, but it's not the hottest star. We're just on the edge of a regular galaxy with who knows how many others in the universe. There is absolutely nothing special about us. But, as strange as it may sound, our puny little world is the most important planet in the entire universe. But it's not important because of you or me. It's important because in all of space, ours is the only planet that's lost. When Adam and Eve sinned, they became the only sinners in the entire universe. Only two people out of who knows how many others turned their backs on God. But God was not content to leave them like that. He had a plan. And instead of Starting over, he chose to do something unexpected. He chose to become a part of the creation that rejected him. As it says in Galatians chapter 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. When the time was right, Jesus came to save the whole world, not because we deserved it, but because we don't. And you see, by doing that, God demonstrated what love is all about. He could have turned his back on us. 
nobody would have even noticed. But he didn't. Jesus come, chose to come to our world as a man, as one of us, to come into the world just like the rest of us do in order to save us. Now, can you imagine what the angels must have reacted like when God was telling them the plan of salvation? I can just imagine all of the angels standing around with their mouths hanging open, saying, he's going to do what? He's going to become a man? God himself? Yes. And what about all those unfallen worlds? Can you imagine when they hear the news that Adam and Eve had sinned and that earth had fallen to the enemy. You can just imagine the, the conversation. Earth? Where is that? Oh, you know, it's that new spot over there. And God's going to do what? He's going to go save them. Well, how many are there? There's two. But he says he'd do it. For one. And all those unfallen worlds and all those angels come and they lay themselves at Jesus' feet in heaven and they worship him and they praise him and they call him holy. But none of that mattered to Jesus as long as we were lost. So Jesus laid aside his godhood and he came as a man. As it says in Philippians, in your lives you must think and act like Christ Jesus. Christ himself was like God in everything, but he did not think that being equal with God was something to be used for his own benefit. But he gave up his place with God and made himself nothing. He was born as a man and became like a servant. And when he was living as a man, he humbled himself and was fully obedient to God, even when that caused his death, death on a cross. Can you imagine how all of the unfallen worlds must have reacted? How could he do such a thing? Because God is love. That is how much Jesus loves you. And it's not just Jesus. The Father and the Holy Spirit think about us the same way. You know, sometimes we have this impression that the Father is kind of grumpy and sitting on his big throne and he's, he's not really on our side. But don't you believe it. That is the deception of the devil. In fact, the opposite is true. The Father wanted Jesus to come so that we could be saved. In 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> that is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Make no mistake, the Father loves you just as much as Jesus does. You know, in Isaiah, the sixth chapter, the prophet got a, got a vision of God high on a throne. And his brightness filled the temple in heaven. And the seraphim, it says, have six wings. But they only use two of them to fly with. They use the other four, two of them to cover their feet and two of them to cover their eyes. Because God is so holy, they can't look at him. That is the Father. But the Father himself would have left all that behind, just like Jesus did. 
He would have been born in that stable. He would have faced the trials. And the Father would have died on the cross for you. Because that's how much the Father loves you. And the Holy Spirit, he would have done the same thing. He would have died on the cross for you as well. The Holy Spirit would have been laid in that manger. He would have been baptized by John. And he would have died with a crown of thorns on his head. But that wasn't the plan. The plan was for Jesus to die for our world. And because of that, our tiny little dust speck in the universe that we live on has become the most important place there is. Not because of you and me, but because Jesus gave himself to us. As a demonstration for us, for the angels, and for the unfallen worlds, that God is love. And that he loves each one of us so much that he would have done all of that for just one of us not just for a whole world. In Revelation, it says that after Jesus comes and the redeemed are with him, the holy city will descend out of heaven and come to this earth. And all of the angels and the Father and the Holy Spirit. And throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity in the future, our little world will be the center of the universe because God will be here. And we will be with him as the evidence that he is love. And if you don't remember anything else about this sermon today, just remember this. Jesus died for you because he can't stand to live without you. Amen.